This is the examination of the hidden human condition. You're listening to the Hidden Killers Podcast. This is the Hidden Killers Podcast with Tony Bruschi. We are talking with Hidden Killers contributor and former FBI special agent Robin Dreek right now, discussing the case against Brian Koberger and some interesting developments that we've been hearing about his past. Koberger kicked out of high school police classes after girls complain. It's according to a former administrator who couldn't go into all of the details because of student confidentiality laws, but it continues to show us more of the same uh, as we try to piece together this individual's personality, does it not? Yeah, no doubt. You know, we talked about this at the very beginning of this case, and that is with every case, with every human being, we have an arc of life. And that arc of life is forged early on. Our genetics and biology give us what we're born with. And then our upbringing, our our nurture part takes over. Mm -hmm. And from those early years, it kind of forms a behavior pattern of things to expect of how we make decisions and things that we're attracted to and things that we try to do in our lives. And early on, I remember I probably one of the first things I ever did and looked at was writings he had done as a teenager. At least I assumed it was him yep. on one of these websites and text messages he was sending and stuff about just about, and you could hear the pain in his voice. You could hear how disjointed he was. Mm -hmm. You could hear that literally this is the making of someone that if he doesn't get immediate help, he's going down the path of severe psychopathy, most likely. And the behaviors he was exhibiting even at an early age of not knowing socially how to fit in was prevalent forever. And so this is one of those instances where we learn a new data point that this is, it's a data point. And at this point you say it would be unusual if it was opposite of this. In other words, imagine we heard, Hey, we just heard from the high school principal that he was in all these different groups and he's well accepted. And so this is really shocking because all the girls in this group and all the other teenagers loved him. That would stand out as odd. Yeah. This kind of fits a behavior pattern. What does it say about parenting in general in, in the United States and some of the issues that we have when it comes to discovering that maybe our child has some issues, ones that are not necessarily the result of nurture. It's just there's something that's not firing right in their brain. And the the roadblock that I think a lot of parents come across is not wanting to admit that there's something wrong with their own child and not wanting to have to go down that road because we can kind of skate them along. We'll just kind of move them from this class to that class without ever really diving too deep into the actual problem. Is that in itself a big problem that we have here where we get so many people that are undiagnosed with anything, never really quite treated? Well, at the same point, we certainly do have people who can be overdiagnosed as well in our country and overtreated. But it seems that sometimes the ones who really need it most, you have the issues where mom and dad, who are the parental figures when he was younger, just maybe didn't, you know, didn't want to think, you know, our little boy's different than the others. Yeah, this one's a really tough one too, <clears throat> because what when you see, or you know, again, we have a thirty thousand foot optic yeah. looking at Koberger's parents and his dad interacting with him. I've got a lot of, I got a lot of compassion for the parents in this one, sure, and that might make people angry as well, and I apologize for that. But <clears throat> from the optic that we've seen, you know, when you do the thought experiment and you look at, so remove that he's been accused of murder and you look at a troubled teen that it appears, you know, the parents were involved in trying to do things and he was seem, he seemed aware that he was having issues as well. Yeah. And whether he got help or not, don't know. We know he had a drug addiction problem for a while. And as a parent, you know, place yourself in that parent role, your heart's broken that you're, little boy is struggling so severely. He's now addicted to drugs. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden, he's not. It's mm -hmm. like he he gets clean, he gets healthy, he's sober, and he's now making something of his life. He's going to college, he's doing all these things. And so it seems like his parents, just because his father comes cross country to drive him back from his PhD studies on Christmas break, no, Thanksgiving break, it, it gives you a sense of there was a caring there, even though they might, who knows if they executed, how they executed that caring and got him help if they knew he needed help. I, you, we don't know that, but yeah. it goes to your point. 
at what point does someone do something, not do something? I don't, oh, man, when it comes yeah. to the type of diseases of the brain and malformations and chemical imbalances and all those things that are the nature part that you can't control. Yeah. You know, at what point do you do something or say something? It's and, a rough call. And what do you do? I'm not in any way questioning the concern of the parents. I think they were very concerned. I think that they almost were putting up too many possibly bumpers or safety nets, if you will. I mean, we have the account that he, the father, went and talked to a neighbor. Hey, you know, my son, and I'm paraphrasing, he kind of has a hard time making friends. You know, just you know, hang out with him if you would, if you get a chance. And he's an adult. I mean, the coworker's in his late 20s, and dad is saying this to the neighbor. So they, they seem to be very aware of this and yeah. wanted to help and wanted to try and keep him going. And I'm sure the last thing in anyone's mind, especially the parents, is that, you know, if I don't give him this bumper, he's going to go and murder four people, allegedly. Yeah. But you certainly know there's something there. But I guess that is the question. And maybe that's the problem that we have. There aren't a lot of resources for a parent in that sort of a situation where it's like, I'm just going to try and do my best. This seemed to work for, you know, so-and-so. There, there isn't a clear direction when someone is dealing with that sort of a thing. Other than half the time in our country, it's just take this pill and pretend that you're better. Yeah, mental health still remains the problem. Yeah. There is no doubt. And especially if you look at serial killers, and it looks like this was probably the, if it was him or not, it's the first step in probably a career of attempting to do this there's not that many no you know and so when you don't have that many people have studied <laughs> studied them and they studied the crimes they study the profiles and all those things but from everything i've read there's some stuff on recognizing it but not a whole lot on preventing it and that therein lies the challenge. And that's not just with serial killers, obviously. It's with all chemical imbalances. Right? It's interesting. I'm reading a book right now, uh, Homo Deus. It's the sequel to a book called Sapiens. It's about the evolution of our species. And this one, Homo Deus, takes a look at us as a species and where we're going from here. So what we've done as a species, the three main driving factors that it talks about is that the drivers for us has been war, famine, and I'm going to pull up right now. Yeah. I apologize. Because then it's going to talk about where it's going to, which actually plays into this. Yeah. Um, I'm sorry if I'm... No, you're fine. Uh, well, oh, famine, plague, and war. And those have been the three drivers that we've tried to overcome. And for the most part, as a species, in the last 100, 200 years, we've done a good job of that. Even though you know we look at true crime here and we look at horrendous things people do, the threat that we have of dying in a violent act today is historically tremendously small comparatively throughout history. And where we're moving from here is really interesting. We're really moving to the conquest of death. Mm -hmm. We really want to just not allow ourselves to reach the mature age that our bodies naturally go to, which is 80. I mean, literally what we are trying to do as a species is go beyond that. And also the finding the key of happiness. Those are two of the greatest things that we as a species are trying to do. And part of that is going to have to overcome these mental health challenges. And if we're going to move beyond, you know, just the famine, plague and war, which we have mostly for as a species, we're going to have to really focus hard on our brain and how to make it healthy for everyone. Sure. Speaking of mental health and just mental awareness of things like this, there's been a lot of talk in the Koberger case specifically, and of course, then it reaches out to all the cases that the true crime community talks about. And the concern is oversaturation. Are there too many voices out there talking about this? Is it tainting a potential jury pool? Is it making it difficult for someone like Koberger to truly have a fair trial. What's your thoughts on that? Does that make, does that taint a jury pool? Does that just inform the public on more information than maybe we would otherwise get in the past? Or is this just reporting that's being done in a different way? It's not necessarily coming from the newspaper or the nightly news. It's coming from independent citizen reporters. Sometimes they're good. Sometimes they're bad. You know, I'm always a glass half full guy, as you know. I think it's both. I think when all the when true crime stuff first started and people paid attention to it and it was just on TV and scripted, 
Then we had the CSI effect, and people and juries expected crimes to be solved in instance. They think DNA is the end all be all. That there's a you know a thing called an open and shut case, and that actually hurt when it came to jury pools, and it hurt prosecutors as well as defense mm-hmm. because that tainted juries. And believe me, you're never going to untaint because that's why we have 12 people because we have confirmation biases and they try to do as great a job as possible to get as, as cognitively intellectually honest people on those juries as you can and balance things out for as hopefully as great a pool of people as you can to be unbiased when assessing the information and evidence presented you. But there'll always be confirmation biases when we're dealing with information and people. Sure. But moving beyond the CSI effect, doing the true crime now where it shows like this, where we actually talk about facts, details in reality, unscripted in real life, I think it balances that equation. I think because I can't tell you the number of times I've talked about Hey, we got to be careful not to have the CSI effect take place here. Yeah. I mean, I've done, and, and you too, you know, being on TV at night or something where people say, hey, we have a bit of DNA. How come they don't make an arrest? Let's take a step back. You can only make an arrest if you have DNA match. And in order to have match, you have to have information in. And this is just one data point of all. So I think shows like this help balance that equation because every time things swing out of balance, something usually brings it back. This is an examination of the hidden human condition. This is the Hidden Killers podcast with Tony Bruschi.